Welcome to another one of our continuing conversations with the leaders of our city who are confronting the challenges of the moment from coronavirus to the ingrained racism of policing. And we're gonna talk about the intersection of those issues tonight. Uh, I'm Mark Levine, your city council member here in Northern Manhattan in the seventh district, also chair of the city council's health committee. And we're joined tonight by someone who is first and foremost, a dear friend of many years, someone who I enormously admire, Kari Lazar White, who has built an extraordinary nonprofit institution serving not just West Harlem in my district, but young people really all over the city. And he's emerged as an important leader nationally, uh, particularly on the intersection of policing, its impact on young people of color, and the ways that positive youth development programming can point the way forward to a healthier and safer city and society. And uh, we wanted to give an opportunity for all of you to chat with him, with us, because of the urgency of the issues that he's been working on now for, for 20 years or more. And we're gonna hear about some of that history. Um, this will be a conversation as they all are. So feel free at any time to put your questions in the chat if you're with us on Zoom. And if you're with us on Facebook, you can also put your questions in there and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, and we do these bilingually to the extent folks want. So I'm just gonna say a few words in Spanish. But I meant that I know I will be in many of those. So Mark Levine, concejal de la Quida Norte de Manhattan y presidente del Comité de Salud. Esta es otra de una serie de charlas con los líderes que están enfrentando a la pandemia y a la crisis de policía acá en Nueva York. Eh, ustedes pueden sentirse libres en hacer sus preguntas tanto en inglés como en español, en la charla, en Facebook o acá en Zoom. Kari, welcome again. It is so great to see you and to have you here. Thank you. Thank Could you, you talk, start by of course, tell, tell us a little bit about the incredible nonprofit you have built, Brotherhood Sister Soul, and how it fits in to the larger conversation we're having now about policing and about young people um, and the challenges they're facing in New York right now. Sure. Um, so again, I appreciate the time to have this conversation and thank you for your leadership on issues as broad as education and parks and really becoming one of the lead voices around the response to COVID um, and really driving the conversation uh, as a council member that was so important in the city when people look into voices of reason, but also of information, uh, you were really one. And so I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for, you know, all thank the work you. you're doing for our city. Um, you know, Brotherhood Sister Soul is a comprehensive youth development organization. We've been around for 25 years. We're celebrating in the midst of these uh, this time of pandemic, 25 years. Uh, there are really three elements of what we do, and I think the third is what speaks to the conversation today, but we can't talk about that without talking about the others as well. And so what we're most known for is providing, uh, you know, really comprehensive direct youth services. So supporting young people from the ages of eight until 22, uh, and that's environmental programming and rites of passage, you know, developing a moral and ethical code. What does it mean to be men and women leaders? brothers and sisters in one's community, a lot of work around improving academic uh, support and uh, you know, work uh, possibilities. We have international study programs in Africa and Latin America every summer, intensive job training program. But all of the work that we do at BroSys is also done through this lens of young people understanding racial issues, economic issues, class issues, gender issues, developing a political awareness that allows them to become change makers. And we know that every effort to change the city and this country have been led by young people. And so we see them as change makers of today. Uh, the second element of what we do is that we've published five books of curricula and we train educators on our model um, across uh, the nation and across the city. And that's one of the ways we've reached young people in other parts of the city, um, helping young people to learn again our curricula. And then the third area that we work in is around trying to organize for justice. And we work broadly in the space of criminal justice. Um, and that includes the effort to raise the age in New York or legalize marijuana, 
shutting Rikers Island. We were very involved in the effort to reform stop and frisk in the city as much as it was reformed. Um, and, you know, we also work on environmental justice issues, uh, what good schools look like, and demanding that all children in this city receive a quality education, um, regardless of the community that they were born into. And so those are the three areas we work in, direct comprehensive services for young people, training of the field, and then third, organizing and activism, you know, as a social justice organization serving black and brown youth. Yes, and of course, your home is in West Harlem. Yeah, we are located in West Harlem, just a couple blocks away from oh, your office. Young people from far beyond the neighborhood, and you're building a new home. Excellent. And I'm not sure if it's my computer or yours, but it um, seems like we're having a bandwidth issue. Are you hearing me okay, Kari? Yeah, you went off for a second um, and uh, came like back, it. but seems like it's working well on my end. I'm not sure. Okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm going to plow forward if, if I need to, to uh, log out and log back in, let me know. Um, your young people have confronted the discriminatory policies of policing and disproportionately aggressive policing in black and brown communities for, I think it would be fair to say, for decades. Can you talk about how your organization and the young people you work with have uh, have seen policing and policing policy over the years? Sure. Um, so you know, I think the first space that we were really involved in was just organizing and, and protesting um, in the ways that we see people protesting now. But, you know, I think one of the, the great difficulties um, of this moment is that you know, the killing of George Floyd is yet another name in a long list. And so Brotherhood Sister Soul was protesting when the name was Sean Bell. And we were protesting when the name was Abner Louima. And we were protesting when, you know, the, the name was Ramarley Graham. And we were protesting when the name was Anthony Baez. And so I think the repetition of it uh, is something that is, you know, extremely um, hard and difficult for people to deal with today that, this continues to be um, a primary issue in our community. And so our young people got very involved to speak out on the issue of stop and frisk in the city. Um, they wrote, uh, you know, an op-ed, Nicholas Pert, one of our alumni for the New York Times, um, that kind of went viral telling the story of what stop and frisk um, experience was like. Uh, they were named litigants in the Floyd case. They organized, they protest, they created art. Um, and they were centrally involved, and Brotherhood Sister Soul was centrally involved with Communities for Police Reform in the effort to reform stop and frisk in the city. And so that was the first way I think we were most uh, involved in a policy effort here. We were also were very much involved in the effort to shut Rikers Island and to raise the age, which obviously are directly intersect with issues of the NYPD and uh, policing. Um, currently, um, you know, our young people are involved in a 2020 campaign. So, you know, I think when we talk about the issue of policing and education, it's really important to, you know, focus on just the disparity of investment. And that's really what the defund or divest from the police movement is about. Um, you know, the movement is about reducing one billion in NYPD funding, which is roughly 16% of their budget. And so what our young people are organizing about is that we want to increase the number of social workers and guidance counselors in our schools. Um, currently in our schools, there's, you know, roughly one to 380 guidance counselors, one to 850 social workers. Um, and instead, we're spending money on over 5,000 police and police employees in our schools. You know, there are more police and police employees in our schools than there are police in any city in America, other than Chicago, LA, Philly, and New York. And so our young people have been at the front of a youth-led effort that includes AQE and includes uh, Make the Road and includes Girls for Gender Equity um, and Integrate NYC to demand investment in social workers and guidance counselors for our children in our schools and a divestment from 
NYPD staff and employees in our school. So that's a central issue that our young people have been working on. Um, and you know, I think the intersection of how we police our schools um, and the idea that we would have police officers in our school and criminalize our young people, and then the issue of stop and frisk, which was you know, this completely discredited, racist, unconstitutional uh, policy that is you know, really a symptom of the broader sickness, which is broken windows policing. And so we have really pushed back on the concept of broken windows policing and the continual over now two administrations um, uh, misuse of the issue of stop and press. When the numbers you cite, Kari, are so stark, if I'm not mistaken, the number of uh, school safety agents, which are part of the NYPD, in our public schools exceeds by a factor of 10 to 1 the number of school psychologists. Correct. And, uh, you know, we talk about indefensible budget priorities. I think that's got to be exhibit A. And I think you brought up such an important piece of the, the budget conversation. When we talk about reducing the budget of NYPD, it is about really positive ways we could better spend that money. And, and the kind of programs that make the city healthier and ultimately even safer uh, by investing in young people. And, and, and talk about that. Talk about the ways that investing in young people actually can, can make this a better city for everybody. I mean, I think when you talk about a prison to a school to prison pipeline, the ultimate uh, end of that, of course, is is prison. It's, so it's not the policing, it's not the criminalization, but it's somebody being incarcerated. Um, the last number I saw was that New York spends over two hundred and forty thousand dollars a year to incarcerate a child. And so, if you just think about that number, and instead what you could use that money for, um, you know, you get an idea of what we're talking about in these budget conversations. But also, when you think about a society that incarcerates a child, the immorality of that. Um, that we would put a child uh, behind bars as opposed to providing a child with the services that she or he needs. And so what we know is that the investment in young people, the investment in anti-poverty programs, and that's really what we're talking about. I mean, for the last 40 years, roughly, when the face of poverty in America has been black and brown, as we both know, the response to poverty was to criminalize poverty. It was to build jails. It was to get, quote, tough on crime. It was to, quote, deal with super predators. Huge amounts of money spent to incarcerate people. When the face of poverty 100 years ago were overwhelmingly European immigrants, we built settlement houses. Mm -hmm. So that's the perfect example of what are your priorities? And if instead we had settlement houses in black and brown communities, young people, um, instead of spending so much money on the criminalizing of young people, we would see very different, you know, returns. And so I think, you know, the issue really is, you know, as you know, a budget is a moral document. It's a statement of priorities. And while right now we're focused on the NYPD issue, of course, this is a broader issue. You're an expert at the budget in the city of New York. There are so many choices that are made during that process of what we will invest in. And so it's not just about policing and education, of course, but it's also about housing and anti-poverty issues and so many other things that are really key. Uh, you know, and, and important to you as well. Well, that is so true. And, and, you know, look at the way our society dealt with addiction in the 90s and the 80s and 90s. That's right. Um, during uh, the crack, crack epidemic and, and other challenges when it was dealt with as a criminal matter. Right. And during the most recent opioid crisis, which... Uh, really touched every community in America, but but certainly touched white communities and rural white communities, and um, and that was even true in, in New York City, uh, where it had a particularly horrible impact in Staten Island, and um, society largely responded as if it were a public health crisis. It is a public health crisis, and of course we should have responded that way in the 80s and 90s as, as well. And it, it's tragic that it took um, an addiction epidemic, an overdose epidemic that um, hit white folks for society to respond that way. And, you know, you can look at a series of challenges in New York City and society from homelessness to mental health, and you can see that we have defaulted to a 
a criminal justice response, a police response. And that ultimately can have deadly consequences. And it's consequences that are felt disproportionately by black and brown New Yorkers. And as you say, that's also a budget question um, because it also happens that we're paying a lot of money for police to go out on every mental health run and every homeless run. Uh, and uh, it's not only having um, bad societal impact, but it's dollars that we could have spent on things like youth development and affordable housing and uh, health care and the things that, that we need to be a, a, a thriving uh, city. And it all comes down to the budget. We're going to talk a lot about the budget tonight because we pass a budget in New York City in uh, inside of two weeks. It's, it's crunch time now. And this is probably the toughest budget that, well, certainly that I've ever faced in, in my, uh, this will, I guess, be my seventh budget cycle. Um, but, but even in the midst of a difficult budget, we've had some, some really uh, messed up prioritization. The, the budget that was proposed uh, back in April had a 32% cut to the Department of Youth and Community Development, right. including a total zeroing out of summer youth employment, or SYEP, while essentially leaving the police department untouched. Um, you know, I think it was one third of 1% cut. Uh, again, Department of Youth and Community Development was a 32% cut. That, that is completely indefensible. That doesn't respect the kind of priorities that we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. um, that was a proposal. We have a chance to fix that in the final analysis. Um, and that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, right here. Were you going to add something on that, on the budget question, Kari? Yeah, I just think that, you know, the last six years to seven years of the administration has seen an increase uh, in the budget by a billion dollars for the NYPD. You know, so I think one of the ironies of the situation we're in right now is that, you know, Mayor de Blasio ran on a campaign of two cities, ran on a campaign of reform of stop and frisk, and spoke out on that issue as a central aspect of his campaign. Yeah. And then when he came into office, he's increased their budget by a billion dollars and refused to reduce it in this current budget cycle, um, as opposed to making the kind of cuts that you're talking about. So, you know, I think that there are budget issues here that, you know, um, we can talk about. And I think that they're key. And, you know, it's, do you continue to utilize the police, some of the areas you touched on, at things that the police are not good at? Uh, things that the police themselves don't want to be called for. Why would police be sent, as your to your point, on a homeless services call as opposed to social workers who can help access services right, for right. them? That's right. Why are the police policing fare evasion? Why are the police policing sex work? Why are the police policing yeah, yeah. folks who are, quote, peddlers, as opposed to when you go to a restaurant, right, somebody from the health department shows up, not the police. So why are you dealing with kind of peddlers on the street? And street peddlers, yeah. Street. yeah, totally. Yeah, of, of somebody being, you know, arrested for selling churros and, you know, the train, right. you know, and children being pulled from their mind. These are all decisions about society. And so to me, part of it's the budget. The other part of it, and why people are obviously in the streets now all across this country and all across the world, I mean, some of the sizes of protests from Berlin to Paris have been unbelievable, is also because of the long historic systemic racism that's throughout the police department that is not about individual quote bad apples but is about a system and how that system is controlled um, and we reimagine what policing can look like so you're touching on budget issues which are absolutely key but it's also kind of reimagining the role of police in our society and look the, the way addiction has been criminalized absolutely um, I think you and I probably both support um, legalization of marijuana um, for a lot of reasons, partly because it's had uh, a disproportionately brutal impact on black and brown communities from an enforcement perspective. Um, also, by the way, we're talking budgets. Why not tax it and use the oh. revenue for Absolutely. all the great priorities that we're talking about tonight? And, you know, in my role as chair of the health committee, I've, I've also looked a lot at the opioid crisis, which is still claiming uh, 
one New Yorker every six hours, the, the rates of fatalities are just heartbreaking. Um, but, you know, our efforts to solve that as a criminal justice problem have failed, clearly failed. And, and we've talked about things like safe injection facilities as a place just to reduce death, which should be our first priority in any crisis. And if you think of it as a public health challenge, which it is, then it's pretty obvious that you want to respond uh, by reducing fatalities, not by locking people up who are in the grips of a very difficult addiction. Um, um, we, we're, one we're, other, we're getting some. One other please, point yeah, on please. that, just quickly, Mark. You know, you say that you know the issue of responding to death is is central, right? I mean, the central role of government is the lives and health and well-being of people. We also know that police departments across the country, not just the NYPD, are actually extremely poor at solving murders and rapes, right? So. The you clearance know, rate the clearance is very low. The clearance rate is often at 40% in many cities and states. So do you want the police to focus on that, or do you want the police to focus on homeless folks and people who are utilizing marijuana and other drugs? So it's, it's an allocation of people and of resources, what we criminalize, what we don't criminalize. And you know, I think those are the conversations that finally we're having in broader spaces. So we're getting some very good questions coming in now from the chat, and I want to invite everyone to keep them coming. But I'm going to start to bring some of them up. We have a question from Sam Filler. He says, what role can our faith institutions play in supporting our youth? Your thoughts on that, Kari? You know, I think that historically faith-based institutions have been central acres, anchors in our community. Um, they have been places where people build community. They've been places where people are fed their, you know, their, their soul and their bodies. Uh, they have been places where people have found the ability to have recreation and lots of faith-based institutions have had sports programs and other things. It's also a place where there are elders who are committed to young people and their education of young people. So I think they can play a central role. I, I see it intersecting with the nonprofit space that what we are community institutions, whether faith-based or non-faith-based, uh, um, and you know, lay, lay, lay people and the lay people, that nonprofits and the faith-based, you know, institutions are anchors in the community. They've always been there. They've always been groups that have been central to engaging young people, but also working to social, for social change. I mean, you know, if you look within the black community, obviously in the civil rights movement and faith-based institutions, that's, that was hand in glove. And so there's a long history of kind of social justice coming out of faith-based institutions when they're really doing, you know, the best work that they can. So Again, I think there's certainly a role in, in all of our communities for that um, and for engaging with those institutions, many of whom are, are led by, you know, important community leaders who have a great influence within community as well. So uh, we have a question from Samantha Chendelheim who says, I'm a social worker and work in a pediatric psychiatry clinic with adolescents who can greatly benefit from Mr. Lazar White's organization. And to remind everybody, it's called Brotherhood Sister Soul. You can look it up, or brosist for short. Um, how can these young people, I guess, uh, presumably this would be um, Samantha's, uh, the, the young people she worked with, how can they get involved in your program? Sure. So first, you know, you go to our website, which is brotherhood-sister-soul, and soul is S-O-L dot org. You can learn about all of our programs and different opportunities. Brosist from our founding has accepted any young person who wants to join. There is no sifting. There is no cost to attend. There's no grade point average. There's no parental involvement necessary because we know that would exclude certain young people. Um, we have documented and undocumented young people. We have staff who speak multiple languages. So really everyone is welcome at Brosis. The only time we have to turn young people away is because of capacity, um, just because of space. Mark mentioned we were having a little bit of technical difficulties at the beginning, so I'm not sure if it came through when we were in conversation about that. but. Brosis is building a new building, a 20,000 square foot building in Mark's district, which will allow us to greatly expand the number of young people we serve, because currently we're, we are often at capacity at programs. So you would go on our website, you can apply there, you can contact us at 212-283-7044. Um, now, obviously, there's one huge caveat to that, which is we are in the time of COVID. So three months ago, it was a very easy next step. We are um, physically closed most days, but we've responded to the COVID reality by uh, really taking on feeding our community. We've provided 25,000 meals to our community and our young people and folks in the neighborhood uh, over the last 12 weeks. Um, so, you know, 
hopefully we'll be back running full programs by the fall. Um, but anyone can join us from any part of the city and uh, can participate in what we do. And this building is, it's going to be a game change for youth development, I think, in the city. It's going to, I think, redefine what's possible in a space that's built from inception yeah. for young people. Uh, young people have had a role in every stage of the design process. And it's kind of an open and uplifting physical environment. Mm -hmm. And I just can't wait for it to finally open. I think it's going to be impactful to, to thousands of young people over the years. So um, uh, ass assuming, fingers crossed, it goes uh, well. We know that construction... You, you and I could talk for hours to, on this topic. It's always it's a little bit on. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, what is the opening date that you're currently working with? So the opening date, we're on schedule for uh, the spring of 2021. So a little, about a year from now, um, we received an exemption from the city and state to continue our construction during this time. So that's allowed us to remain on schedule. Um, and just one quick point, kind of connecting these two conversations. You know, our young people created an exhibit uh, last year about what it feels like to be policed in their schools. And so when you came into the, the exhibit, you had to walk through a mock metal detector and you had to have a mock wand passed over you. And the young people had words all over the wall about what it felt like to have um, security in that way in your school and what that made them feel and the, the uh, effect on their psyche. And so we know what jails do to people. We know what you know, hospitals feel like. We know what our young people feel like when they walk into what they feel is an institution that's not focused enough on their learning. And so the way we wanted to dis design our building was a building about the enlightenment of children. That was really a space where they just felt they could be creative and grow, that was theirs, that was green all over, that had light that ran throughout it. Um, and the architect designed it so that there were these kind of five elements like a hand holding young people um, and, you know, we, we take that as, as our, our mission, that we are entrusted with people's young, young people. Uh, so we have a question from Dawn Gresham. She says, do you think that mandated de-escalation training or what's called, quote, critical decision-making training or trauma-informed policing would be important components of police reform for interactions with youth and adults? So... Um, Many of the things that people are currently protesting about in the streets across America, there is a list of demands. The vast majority of those policies were already in place in Minneapolis. It did not stop a police officer from putting his knee, uh, or a former police officer from putting his knee on a man's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds and killing him. Um, I think that these individual policies, including the, you know, passing the chokehold law, the Eric Garner law here in New York, 50A, uh, de-escalation training, I do think it's all important, but I don't think it's sufficient. I don't think that we can reform a system that is as uh, destructive as currently policing is in this country. I think of it the same way as I think of the prison system. I think we have to completely reimagine what it looks like. We have to change and shrink the footprint of policing. We have to take on the police union and allow for police officers to be fired and removed from the police force um, when they commit lower level acts so that we never get to the choking and killing of Eric Gardner or George Floyd, et cetera. And so I think training is a part of it, but training is insufficient if there's not um, ramifications for actions. Um, if people don't go to jail for doing this, if we continue to call police into situations they are not able to handle and manage. Um, and so I think there are so many different things that have to happen that we almost have to stop using the word reform. I think we have to really completely reimagine what policing looks like. And whether New York, and this is a question for us as New Yorkers, and I think the numbers are key, right? Los Angeles has a little under 10,000 police officers. New York has 35,000 police officers. You know, there was a famous moment on a 60 Minutes interview where Ray Kelly, when he was commissioner, said that they could shoot down a, a helicopter or a plane if necessary. And the question became like, who would give that order? Should New York have an army? Should My New God. York have that level of policing? And that's a question that we have to answer. And I think as long as we continue to allow the massive police footprint in our city, 
you will continue to have Eric Gardner's and George Floyd's no matter what training you do. Yes, some of the, the so-called reforms that we've pushed through have failed. You know, we had supposedly de-escalation training of the right. entire NYPD, and then you saw what happened in the protests over the last couple of weeks. It was escalation, not de-escalation. Right. Uh, the, the training didn't work, and it's partly because uh, there has been an unwritten understanding that there has not been accountability for police misconduct in New York City, most famously with Daniel Pantaleo, who, uh, who uh, murdered uh, Eric Garner, but many, many more cases that aren't in the news of, of officers who did everything from lie under oath to um, assault uh, a suspect in custody which are fireable offenses, according to the rules, but are still on the force. And there just hasn't been a consistent disciplinary process, and that is pervaded uh, policing. And so um, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of the tinkering that was attempted in the last six years or so clearly didn't work, and didn't work in Minneapolis, and it hasn't worked here. And so it, it's time... Uh, to to re envision policing and to ask fundamental questions about what role it should play in the city and the society, right. um, which is exactly what we're talking about here. Um, so we have uh, let's see, we have so, so many good questions coming in. Um, uh, we have a question from uh, Dolores Peña. Uh, how can we bring our youth information as they don't trust or have hope with the police department or youth involvement? And I, I guess what the Lotus is asking is, I mean, I, I think it's self-explanatory, Akari, but I mean, there's just such understandable distrust right now among young people. I think probably of, of not just police, but of government and, and maybe even of, of institutions in general. At, and how are you how are you overcoming that well i mean we were created as an institution to respond to the fact that so many young people felt disconnected and felt that you know they didn't have a way out uh, we were founded at you know the height of the crack epidemic here in new york founded in east harlem at the school that my co-founder jason warwin had gone to just four years before we started this work at you know 22 years old um, and so I think that that distrust has always been here. I don't think it's new. Um, you know, the reality is that the police have been seen as an occupying force, certainly in black and brown communities, you know, since the beginning of this country. Police forces were created as slave patrols, as the modern police force is based on people who went to reclaim property for people whose property had fled, their property being human beings. That is the origination of police forcing uh, forces in the country. And so you don't start there. Obviously, police forces throughout the South were hand in hand, if not members of the Klan. Um, and so then you come to New York and to urban spaces, and you can read any writer who wrote about being from black and brown communities in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And they would talk from James Baldwin to Langston Hughes about you know, the terror of police. So this has been a constant reality. And that's why I think when you're working with young people, you know, a lot of times there are these programs about kind of community police relations. You know, I, again, I, I don't think the police are, the, their role is to be doing, you know, police athletic league and youth development for the kids. And we were very much against this youth force, youth core that the NYPD and de Blasio tried to push forward. And we were asked to come to meetings. And what was, was that? Youth, what was youth, that? The youth core, the NYPD, that they were trying to launch uh, over the last year. Uh, I forget the right. exact terminology. I think it's the youth corps they were calling it. Right. 600 police officers who were going to track young people and engage oh, with young people. And they asked right. us to participate and we refused to. Because right. why would we, we want more police engagement with our young people? We want more social worker engagement, more guidance counselor engagement, more educator engage, engagement, not more police. Let the police do the job that they should be doing, which is solving serious crime and not doing currently what they're doing, which is engaging so often with New Yorkers in ways that they do not need to have those touch points. Yeah, it's so true. So um, we have a question from Meredith Berkman, who I think has been pretty inspired by hearing you speak and is asking about volunteer opportunities with BROSIS 
um, which of course in the COVID era uh, are, are probably not what they, they were, but are there ways for folks who want to help out either digitally, uh, I'm not sure what those would be, mentoring or any kind of other projects that would be appropriate at this time for you all? Well, let's hope that there's some level of reopening coming soon. Yeah. Um, normally, again, we have an array of volunteer opportunities from working in our garden with us and helping to plant and clean and set up a garden, mentoring of young people, uh, working with young people on college essays, um, you know, being professional mentors. Let's say you're an architect or you're in the TV business, welcoming our young people to come and visit you in your work environment and they can be exposed to workforce development. Um, there are also ways that people support our events. We do lots of kind of fundraising events and help to spread the word. Um, and we've had volunteers who have come in on specific projects. Let's say you have a lot of background in technology and you want to, you know, help us with some of our technolo technological needs, you know. So those have traditionally been the, the ways to get involved. Currently, we don't have volunteer opportunities um, just because our staff, we have kept our staff full time doing all the, the work for our young people. Um, and we're really trying to figure out, as is the whole city, and as you know better than me, Mark, how we plan without all the information we need. So what will our programming look like this summer? Will it be some virtual and some in person? Will it be all virtual? What will the mixture be? And so we almost have to have three plans. And so we're not going to incorporate volunteers into that now. But I hope come the fall, there will be a plenty of volunteer opportunities available. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that you all have been on the vanguard of engaging young people in, in growing, selling, and, and eating and preparing yeah, sure. uh, healthy food. And they manage the garden and they bring 30,000 pounds of food every year to 2,000 community residents in a community that, you know, has been deemed a food desert. Uh, in addition, they grow and tend to 30 vegetable and fruit crops that are in the garden right next to our building, and the community just harvests them and takes them, and that's collard greens to mint to apples to pears. Um, and we also are a partner with Corbin Hill, and we are a CSA in the community. We're one of only two of all of Corbin Hill CSAs that has continued throughout this crisis. So food is still picked up every Wednesday. Um, and now we've, of course, added to that the huge food distribution. But normally, yes, our garden and farmer's market are great ways to engage with our young people. So we, we've had a number of questions, Kari, about uh, the NYPD budget and, and how much we could really cut. And so I've worked with a bunch of colleagues in the council, and we really believe that we can and should cut a billion dollars from the budget. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, engaged in, in furious negotiations now behind the scenes with the mayor for the next two weeks. Um, but that's a big goal, which is doable. And could you talk about where, and you've, 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 you've touched on this some, but what, what are the departments of city government, the kinds of programs that you would want to invest money that we were able to divert out of uh, policing? Oh, I think underfunded areas that the police are currently engaging with those communities and instead other departments should be engaging with those communities are youth. So you're talking about DOE um, and you're talking about DYCD. You're talking about uh, homeless services. Um, you're talking about, you know, any anti-poverty work in the city which so often, again, we're criminalizing the poor. Um, the city has to tackle um, you know, what I call blue collar housing. Um, there has not been sufficient housing for people in blue collar positions throughout the city. Um, that's another thing that I think should be invested in. It's why a billion dollars is, is macro insufficient. I mean, I think you and your colleagues have done a great job at you know, really putting the mayor's you know, feet to the fire on this issue, but it's beyond the NYPD's budget. It's also about the New York City budget, which I believe last year was 93 billion. And where are those resources going? And what are we doing you know, with those resources? So the NYPD is part of it. I think a billion dollar cut, I think it should be more than that. A billion dollars takes us back to 2015. So in 2015, you know, the city also had the largest you know, police force by far in the country. Um, and there was no thought that it was underfunded. So. That's why I keep using the word reimagine, Mark. I think that 
you know, we have to really talk about what is the role of police. And some of that's not about the police. Some of that's about legislature. Again, should marijuana be something that's policed or legalized and taxed? What about harder drugs? What about sex work? You know, there's a lot of argument that transportation should be free in the city. If you're a wealthy person, you can drive the roads. If you're a middle class person, you can drive the roads for free. If you're a low income person, why should you have to pay to get on a bus or a train? Uh, you know, the Fair Fares program really articulated this, which Community Service Society really led the effort, and I'm proud to serve on their board. You know, there was no means testing for Metro cars. If you were worth a billion dollars and you were a senior citizen, you got a discounted Metro card. If you were worth a billion dollars and your child went to Stuyvesant, you know, he or she got a free Metro card. But if you were a working class New Yorker, you didn't get a discounted Metro card. It makes no sense. So we have to just think about policy in a different way now. And I think that's what we're doing. We're reimagining. And I think that's what the movement is really about. Absolutely. We, we have a, a, a good question from a mutual friend of ours, uh, Marty Meyerson, who's a leader in her own right. She's asking about the kind of, of, I guess, psychological screening that police officers undergo and the extent to which they have mental health support. Um, while on the job. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, first, I'm certainly not an expert in the area of kind of labor um, kind of management or of these kind of screenings. And I think that that's where we need professionals to do this work. I think Marty's right on that part of the problem, again, you know, you see this with the high rate of suicide from police officers, that there aren't the supportive services that police officers need to deal with much of the trauma they face or EMT for what they face or firefighters and what they face. So I think this idea of kind of a bravado often of uniformed officers to push through when they're going through lots of trauma because of what they've seen and been forced to deal with. So I think, you know, mental health support, psychiatric services for police officers will screen before they come in to ensure that you're keeping out people at a much higher rate who don't have any business being on the force. Um, but also then once they're on the force to deal with the traumas of their life, because you know, those traumas are real. Um, so I think that's key. I also think, you know, it speaks, Marty's question and, and, and your framing of it speaks to why this is such a complicated issue in New York, which is because of the size of the department. You know, if you go to Ferguson and there are 60 police officers in Ferguson, if you go to Oakland and there's less than a thousand police officers, putting in place bars that keep people out through psychiatric tests or services and support or retraining it's a very different thing with 60 people or 800 people than it is with 35,000. It's also a very different thing budget-wise. And so we have to, again, look at this from a labor perspective, but also look at it from what does policing look like? And I think if we change what policing looks like, then it returns to Marty's point, which is then who we look for to be police officers will change. And the kind of services we put in place to support police officers will change because we're no longer looking for this kind of warfare policing that this country has embraced and supported and bought tanks for and bought, you know, you see these scenes of, of people protesting. I've been in more protests over the last two weeks than I can count. And you see police in riot gear. Why are you wearing riot gear to walk with New Yorkers down the street to, you know, to peacefully protest? There's no reason for that, but that is still kind of the approach to policing. You know? Yes, and the amount of, of surplus military equipment, a lot of which came out of the yep. Iraq War, um, uh, the, the amount of that that's made it into police departments has definitely contributed to the warrior culture. Um, and that's not the right culture for a police department. Uh, they shouldn't think of themselves at war with the communities that should be protecting those communities. But um, I think when people talk about demilitarizing, it's the kind of um, military grade vehicles and equipment that uh, I think folks have rightly pointed to as contributing to that culture. Um, so we have a question from Arturo Carvajal, who says, um, Governor Cuomo has called uh, for a process that every city in New York would go through to uh, discuss and eventually reform police uh, over the next nine months. Um, do we have any sense about how uh, communities in New York would have a voice in that? Uh, and uh, if, if you know any more, tell me, Kari, that 
this this was just announced in the last few days by the governor. Uh, it's it's a, a re envisioning process that every city, obviously including New York City, has to go through by April first of next year of twenty twenty one, and um, so we don't know yet anything about how that would be structured in New York. But you can bet that it has to include impacted communities. It would have to. And, uh, and folks like Kari and myself will certainly fight for that. Did you have anything you know or want to add on that, Kari? No, other than everything you said that we don't know what the structure will be, but what we do know is that these kind of uh, reports will come from the police departments and municipalities themselves before they can receive state funding. That's kind of the idea around it. And so it's still going to return to this question. We know the fight that was in place when we wanted to expand the inspector general of the police and the resources there and, and the lack of teeth with the uh, civilian complaint review board. So I think it's going to return to certain fights and struggles that we've you know, certainly been a part of you know, for some time uh, to ensure that the NYPD really goes through that process. Again, just using the numbers I use for other cities and there's, n there's nothing in the state of New York that's even in the same realm, the same <laughs> neighborhood as, as the NYPD. So, what happens here is going to be completely different and it's going to take massive political you know, will to do it. You know, we, we are in the midst of a pandemic, let us not forget. So I, I do want to take a moment to ask you, how has this pandemic affected the families that you work with? Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, how does it continue to affect life in, in the communities that you're serving? Well, I think anyone who either reads the news or lives in you know, low-income black and brown communities knows that this virus, while it can affect anyone, any you know, nationality, any ethnicity, any class, and it certainly has, it is disproportionately affecting low-income black and brown people. It is who is getting the virus at higher rates and it is certainly who is, di who is dying at higher rates. So we have you know, um, you know, seven or eight young people now slash alumni who have had parents who have died from the virus. Oh my God. Um, we terrible. have multiple staff who have family members who have had the virus and staff who have had the virus. Um, you know, you can see how rife our community is with the virus. And so, you know, when you talk to a young person who's supposed to be learning from home and, you know, they're learning from home in a two bedroom house with five people and somebody has COVID and there's no ability to social distance, that's also affecting them. Yeah. Uh, we did a project with Carrie Mae Weems, the, the noted visual artist, where she talked with our young people and alumni about what it was like to experience COVID and then wants to incorporate their words into visual uh, product. And, you know, it was just so powerful to hear the young people just talking about the day-to-day -day trauma of what it was like that they all had family members with the virus, that they were living with it within their homes, their immediate families. You know, it's terrifying for us all to walk out and have to wear masks. I mean, the whole city has changed. And if you can't come home and close your door and have a respite, um, then you're constantly dealing with that trauma 24 hours. And for so many of our young people, that is their reality. And so as an organization, we've greatly increased our mental health support for our young people in this time helping them to understand it and deal with the trauma, made ourselves even more accessible, contracted with several clinicians to provide support. And we also are providing food for our members every single week so that their families have food. And just one quick example of the racial class disparate effect of the virus is that in upper middle class and wealthy households, the idea for the most intensive part of the social distancing was we'll stay home, Maybe you go to a supermarket once every two weeks. If you can get enough food, you'll order things in. Your cash, your financial ability gave you an ability to navigate that. But what did we tell low-income black and brown kids? Three times a day, leave your house to go get meals from schools. And it was great that they could do it, but it meant three times a day they were being exposed and there was no way for them to have enough food in their house. And so that's just the kind of example where it was a great policy and I'm glad DOE did it, but I don't think there was enough awareness. So at the same time that they're getting food, they're exposed and bringing that virus potentially home to their parents or grandparents. Yeah, it's, it's such a good point. Also, the quality of that food being given out of schools, uh, you know, peanut butter, jelly, and uh, potato chips. It's not, and, for not that, like, and for that reason, Mark, that's why yeah. we got into doing what we're doing. I mean, we're buying fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, meat, pasta, red sauce, you know, everything that you would need for a three, you know, three meals a day for a family for two weeks 
because they couldn't find that elsewhere. Yeah, the, the demand for food is, is alarming. It's an indication of, I mean, we're, we're managing so many multiple crises here, but there's an economic crisis here too. And it manifests with unprecedented demand at every food bank, food pantry, soup kitchen. Um, I've seen the long lines that process. We've done a number of food distributions out of our office. Um, we are routinely getting over 1,000 people. Um, we're doing everything we can to social distance, but line stretching uh, for many blocks is a reflection of desperate need. And that's actually getting worse. Uh, coronavirus, thank God, is receding by most health measures. Not going away, folks, uh, but we're not at the worst as we were in April. But the economic crisis is still very intense. Um, and, you know, it, it's always worth mentioning the stats on the most heartbreaking impact at all, which is fatality from COVID-19. In a citywide, the fatality rate is double for African-American and, and Latinx New Yorkers relative to whites, but zoom down to a neighborhood level. And in places like West Harlem, zip code 10031, the fatality rate is five times what it is in wealthier parts of the city. And actually, it's even more stark in places like um, East Elmhurst, Queens, or Far Rockaway, Queens, or the Northeast Bronx, where it can be 10 times the fatality rate, even potentially more relative to wealthy areas. And unfortunately, the link between the two pandemics we're facing in criminal justice and health is racism. And racism has also very much defined the coronavirus. In the ways you mentioned, housing um, has been a major driver of the spread of this for the reasons you mentioned. People can't isolate because they're in crowded apartments. Also work, uh, because not everyone has the luxury of telecommuting and they are doing essential jobs which put them in contact with the public in supermarkets and healthcare, bus drivers. Uh, that's definitely driven the drive. And then of course, uh, it's healthcare and access to health insurance. and years, decades, generations of unequal access to healthcare, which have led to disproportionate rates of diabetes, of hypertension, and, and even obesity is, is, is driven by lack of access to affordable, healthy food, which process has been working on for many years because it's still, we have very unequal access to healthy food. Um, and you know, all that didn't happen yesterday, it's years in the making, but uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a form of racial inequality that has now impacted this health crisis at the same time that we're confronting uh, racism and policing. And, and it's all impacting places like West Harlem and Washington Heights and the communities that, that Brosis is, is, is serving. Um, we, we're, we're only down to about five minutes, so I want to get a couple more questions if we can. This one's from an anonymous person, and it's okay to be anonymous. This is a question about the 30th precinct, which is your home, our home precinct in West Harlem. Do you think that police brutality is a problem in this precinct in the 3 um, This person says, you know, what about under-policing? Is under-policing also a problem? So, uh, you know, how, how do you address both sides of that, of that argument? Uh, uh, police brutality is an issue in every precinct and in every community in the country. That's the conversation we're having now. You can have a mayor like in Atlanta who says that you know she will root it out. You can have a police chief in Atlanta who's giving, having conversations with protesters and people are saying that's the kind of police chief you should be. And then just a couple of weeks later, you can have a man who's drunk, sleep in his car in a drive-through and is confronted by police officers and has a completely coherent, definitely drunk, but coherent conversation and says, my car is parked, can I just walk home? My sister lives one block away. It's the last clear statement he said. And instead of the police officer saying yes, and his life being saved, he begins and in initiates an interaction that results in him shooting and killing um, yet another black man. And so that police chief then resigns. So to me, it's not about a precinct or individual police officers. Again, it's not about you can have the best mayor elected in the city, um, if that day were to come and he or she could appoint the best police commissioner and, you know, with that team, it still would be an issue because this is 
systemic. And that's what we mean by the word systemic. It is throughout the system. The 30th precinct used to be called the Dirty 30, yeah. right? So that was for a long period of time. So it has a long history. Um, are there police officers there who are doing their job and not being brutal? Of course. Are there police officers there who are brutal? Of course. There's no way around that. I've seen it. I've seen it on the corner of Brosis. I've seen the raids of young people. I've seen them be violent. So, you know, we've seen both sides of it, and um, it has to be tackled. Yeah, and the, the use of the word under-policing by this, this person, um, and I'm going to interpret what, what that might have meant, um, because I've heard this from a lot of folks, uh, what about public safety? And, of course, we have to make public safety a top priority for the city. I don't think anyone disputes that. I think what we're talking about is the kind of programming that ultimately does make us safer and healthier. If you give young people opportunity, if you give them emotional support, uh, if you Im improve environmental conditions, uh, that's proven to improve public safety. And of course, in the short term, you still need policing for some purposes. I mean, perhaps that's a controversial statement, but I think Kari said, you know, response to the violent incidents. Um, but that doesn't need, mean you need uh, an armed person responding to someone who's having a mental health challenge. But also, uh, sorry. Please. Also, I think it's, it's the framing about what safety means. Over the last 40 years, the uh, prison system has increased by 400%. This country has more guns than any country in America and in the spends world, yeah. more money on police in the world and spends more money on policing than almost any, quote, democracy. And there are more homicides and violence in this country than in almost any of its peer countries. Right. Yeah. So, you know, maybe you would put Brazil in a similar place as the United States in terms of some of these issues. But, you know, we're in the top one or top two on a list where you don't want to be number one or number two. So with all of that investment, we're not safe. With all of that investment, it's not working. With all of that investment, there still continues to be this level of violence. And so the approach is that there are other ways to deal with many of the issues. And then, you know, when you talk about the fact that over 95% of, quote, crime in America is nonviolent property theft. So this idea that, you know, the police are out there dealing with violence everywhere is simply not accurate. It's not supported by their numbers. It's not supported by any research. Yeah. And look, compare us to other countries, and we don't stack up well. The number of um, police killings annually in the U.S. is over 1,000. In the United Kingdom, it was three last year, not 300, three police killings last year. In Japan, with a population of, I think, over 150 million, there were no police killings last year. Now, none of those societies are perfect. We understand that policing is not perfect in those societies. But I think it shows that um, there's another model. There are other models that are possible. And as Kari says, this the results not. show that what we're doing is not working. What, what's that? No, I said this one's not working. It's yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and uh, the, the, the mass incarceration didn't work. And um, militarization of police didn't work. And it, it, it's time to reboot and to consider bold new models with, with the ultimate goal of, of keeping us safe, but uh, through, to through health. Coming to the, end, but I just wanna, the thing that also has to be named, I think, in every one of these conversations is the result, right? The fruit from this you know, poisonous tree of policing that this 400% increase in prisons is because of broken windows policing, subjective policing, the quote, war on drugs, the war on crime. So as we're having the policing conversation, we also have to have this conversation of the hundreds of thousands of people who are in jail and should not be in jail. There's a next conversation about what jail should look like, but these people are in jail because of the policing that was done that placed them in jail. And so if we're gonna legalize marijuana and have it as big business in America, then we should not have people who are locked up for marijuana charges, just as one example and one framing of, I think, the kind of question we have to confront. Yeah, and when, when I'm gonna say when, because I'm, 
optimistic that we're going to legalize marijuana. We have to expunge the criminal records of people because it wouldn't be fair. Uh, it wasn't fair then, and it, it would be the height of hypocrisy now to have people face a lifelong detriment from that record uh, in an era where we're legalizing it. So that's got to be part of the deal, and uh, we could do a whole conversation on marijuana, but we also need to empower local entrepreneurs and make sure that it's not, I don't know, Philip Morris that ends up uh, making money off, the, uh, off, off that new industry. So we're, we're at the end of our time, Carl. This has been an incredible discussion. Um, the links to Brosis uh, were put into the chat. And, um, but t tell us again, uh, what's the best way for folks who want to support you financially? Because I'm not afraid to say it. These are tough times for nonprofits. And some of your normal fundraising isn't available. Um, is there a link we could put in the chat? If you read it out, we can do that. T tell us, what's the best way to get involved with and support your incredible organization and the work you're doing with young people. So please go to our website, which is brotherhood-sistersoul.org. Follow us on social media, on you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We are brosis512, 512 being our address, 512 West 143rd, so brosis512. And your support is key to supporting our young people. And just know that, you know, right now, as I've often said, we are facing these twin plagues of COVID um, and responding to, you know, the historic racial, um, you know, issues of, of white supremacy and, and racism in this country. And Brosis is at the front lines of both of those issues and has been for a very long time in responding and supporting our community and working for, you know, racial and economic equity. So we hope you can support us, yes, financially, but also hopefully soon as volunteers and get involved in our work. Thank you, Kari. We're getting many, many, many compliments uh, about your conversation today and your work on our chat right now. So I know it's appreciated. We're grateful we spent, you got to spend an hour with you. Um, and we'll continue to support you every way we can. Thank you for your leadership, for your wisdom, for your voice, and all you're doing for, for New York City. Thank you so and much. thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, we'll be back again next week. And in the meantime, stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.